All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jonathan Levin. I'm a columnist with Bloomberg Opinion, and I'm here with my colleagues, John Authors and Richard Abbey. Uh, in the Point of Return newsletter, uh, these guys are starting a new feature called the Year of Descending Dangerously, in which they'll track what could be a slow, rocky, and potentially perilous descent from uh, extremely high coordinated high interest rates all around the world. Uh, John Authors, why is this perhaps the most important story in the world right now? Why, why did you decide to do this project? In the economic world, I don't think there's anything more important. What I think matters is uh, to try to get international context rather than focusing so much on the Fed. I think there's a lot of value to be taken in looking at patterns across the world. Other other central banks have smaller economies, but their direction of travel, the decisions they're making in the situation they're in um, is indicative of what might happen. And you also have the fact of collective action issues that if the Fed stays higher for longer because inflation is sticky in the US but not elsewhere, that makes it harder for other people to cut when the case for cutting there is clearer because um, because higher rates in the US will mean that that will weaken their currencies and that is inflationary. So coordination at this point is vital and we want to track it. Uh, and I guess the final thing, I, we've had you know, the debate about soft landing or hard landing or no landing. Um, uh, it's fascinating that there are still plenty of, there's still plenty of division of opinion uh, about what that path is uh, in, uh, and, and, you know, most of us have a fairly clear idea of what we think is most likely. Very few of us are certain about it. I can imagine any of those three scenarios. Hopefully, this is as good a way as any of, of finding or spotting which of those trends is uh, is emerging before it happens. I, I mean, what? But you know, one of the things that we did discover from the the work we did was that the the descent outside of a, a few emerging markets, which which hiked rates earlier, the descent really has barely got going. Okay, fair enough. Well, let, let's look at, at what that actually uh, looks like in some of these uh, fantastic uh, visuals. So the the first great visual that you, you guys put in, in your piece is sort of breaking down inflation trends between developed markets, emerging markets, and frontier markets. There are some fundamental differences here. Here, right? In in general, uh, the the least developed markets among them always uh, generally experience more more inflation. And you might say that they they had uh, a greater a greater uh, beta to the global trend uh, during the big spike in uh, uh, sort of 2021 2022. Uh, and they're coming down with a, a bit of a faster velocity as well. But but so walk us through this chart of global inflation dynamics looked through looked at through the prism of developed versus emerging versus frontier markets here. Um, I'll start, Richard. I, 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 that's okay. I think we, I think the things, as you said, the, what you would expect is the frontier markets. They're generally less developed. They have more difficulty containing inflation and you would expect inflation at any point to be higher. Uh, and indeed, you can see that um, the inflation surge that, that they experienced was very much worse than um, you saw elsewhere. I think the other thing, though, that's, that's fascinating is that um, the concept of emerging markets has been around you know, 40 years or so now, um, it looks as though the emerging markets, the, those countries that are middle income that aren't totally um, in the developed club yet, but that are plainly moving in that direction and treated as such by investors, they do appear to have emerged to a fairly clear extent. As you see if on, that, on that line, average inflation in the big emerging markets is actually now down to the level of average inflation in the developed markets. 
Um, so the kind of institutions they've developed, um, you know, the, the local capital markets and so on, have apparently reached the point where they have uh, been able to handle inflation absolutely as well as uh, as the developed markets, which is obviously very heartening. Um, might also tell you something about how the, a lot of developed market central banks were far too slow on the uptake. Yeah, and, and anything you wanted to add about this graphic, Richard? I, I, I'm not hearing you. Yeah. So, so like John was saying, um, we we saw clear trends, uh, especially coming from the frontier markets where inflation was already much harder to contain and that now the pandemic comes through and we see that they, they tend to um, rise as um, higher than everybody else. And for me, I was particularly interested in the frontier market because it's one area that I felt that um, it's, uh, yes, we do get a lot of attention on the developed markets and the emerging markets, but not quite a lot goes into the um, attention goes um, into the frontier market. So that was what I was looking at. And seeing that trend kind of also uh, was a, a bit uh, shocking to me because I was I was kind of thinking that um, the frontier market um, would, um, given, given that inflation spikes so much over there, they will probably go a bit harder in terms of trying to rein in inflation. But it looks like um, they also were slow to react. So we saw rates kind of also delaying in coming down. And so that's a kind of a thing that really struck me about the, um, the frontier market here. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you, you know, we talk a lot about central bank credibility in, in developed markets. Uh, it certainly looks from from your graphic like the emerging markets have achieved uh, a good deal of that that credibility. Uh, do you find that that's coming across in the in the frontier markets, Richard? Well, I think I think um, largely uh, I don't know whether it, it has to do with the the lagging um, the rates decisions from the central banks in the frontier market, but it, lo it looks like um, whatever they they probably set out to do um, when the pandemic struck probably either did not work or it's taking a long longer time to reflect on the market. So the frontier market is something that we, we may have to take it. Um, a deeper look into to see what is actually happening. But when you compare to the emerging markets, which is kind of like the closest that uh, um, the frontier market could get, um, it looks like the emerging market has a lot of um, lessons or a lot of um, things that frontier markets could learn uh, could learn from. So yeah, so it's, it's something that I, I think we would probably need to dig deeper into it to, to be able to make sense out of what the yeah. central banks in frontier market need to do or what they, they have been doing and how that is translating into rates. Yeah. It, it, I, I mean, the, this, this, this ain't just filling, you know, the, the dissent is only just starting, but unless there are major mishaps over the next year or so, as so we're tracking this, at the moment it looks like a, a group of emerging market central banks have, have hand this much better than either the lesser the countries that are less rich than them or the developed markets and that is a, a very interesting lesson to get to carry forward Un unless something goes wrong in the next matter of months that's it does look as though there's a there's a group of countries that have significant managed to manage this problem significantly better than others hmm and and uh, uh, while we're on inflation itself, I also wanted wanted to ask. So there, in in the United States, there's been this narrative uh, over the past two months that there may be some hints of call it a a, a reacceleration of core inflation, or or maybe call it a uh, a stalling of the disinflation process. When you look across the panorama of global economies, does that narrative hold up? I think stickiness does. Um, that it's not just the US, which obviously dominates attention, but in, in general, getting below, getting back to 2% is proving difficult everywhere. 
I mean, that raises the issue of whether you really want to get back down to 2%. The world was, you know, of the 80s and 90s went well enough with inflation generally humming along at a bit above two. Um, but uh, the idea that wages, inflation, and, and that could create, you know, stickiness in the inflation that makes it harder to get get it the fast, the, the last few points lower does seem to be does seem to be a global issue worse in some places than others obviously countries are different but the the, uh, the dynamics of the problem are fairly similar in different places and that creates fairly similar problems for people in different places okay well let's uh let's keep taking people uh through the package uh here um I, I wanted to point out in the previous graphic, Im important to note that you took Turkey and Argentina out of the picture. Those are idiosyncratic uh, stories. Do you want to just talk briefly about, about why you did that with the data? Well, we played around with various things. We could also, we could have got a fairly similar result also with the median. Hmm. Um, I thought it was probably better providing we let people know what we had done just to take Turkey um, is the exception to the rule because it actually cut rates several times from 21 through to 2023 um, because it actually thought that was a good idea and nobody else did that and it was a disaster. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure because it was so completely setting itself in a different direction from everybody else I was nervous that that would um, skew the findings in a way that wasn't um, that wasn't appropriate. You know, they they've just raised interest rates to fifty percent uh, because inflation is even higher than that, and that's a serious problem. In the case of Argentina, you know, they, they last year they took the very great risk of of uh, in, you know, in electing Javier Milei, very hardcore libertarian guy who wants to do away with the Argentine peso altogether. That, that tells you something about how bad things are there. Uh, the last I heard, I, the last I checked, I think Argentina inflation is over 200%. Rates were something like 20% going into the pandemic. Um, so, you know, the economy had such deep-seated problems that predated the pandemic to such an extent that, that again, uh, I thought it was better just to exclude it. As, as you can see, if you do include it in the frontier, it changes the picture completely. Um, and I don't think that's um, realistic. We could, to be clear, we could also have used the median. It was a, a close call, but we thought probably better to make those exclusions and um, make clear why they were why they were excluded, because you know they're both countries of some significance, and then. You know, their performance is radically different from everyone else. For sure. So, so let's just move on here to a, a sort of how the the world uh, responded. And I think this is such a, a fascinating graphic here. So. Uh, what you've done here is you've taken interest rates all around the world uh, and you've reflected them as a Z-score. Uh, essentially, how many standard deviations uh, is uh, each country's central bank from what would be normal uh, based on a historic average for that particular market? Because you, you really can't, uh, can't compare those frontier markets to the developed markets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so... Uh, what you do here is you sort of take us on a little uh, little journey from uh, the early pandemic days uh, through uh, current times, and you you show us how uh, high uh, rates have really gotten relative to uh, to to what would be considered. Uh, normal by any particular market's own standard, uh, and it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty remarkable. But by, by and large, you see the vast majority 
of markets are quite a few standard deviations above uh, anything that they had been used to in the decade prior to uh, the COVID-19 mm. pandemic. Uh, you do see markets such as Brazil uh, now inching back to towards some semblance of normalcy, but the global average uh, is still... Uh, I don't want to say in uncharted territory, but uncharted territory for uh, anybody that, you know, started trading within the past decade or so. Uh, so uh, walk us through the significance of, of, of this and how it uh, sort of points to the, the perils that you point out in the opening paragraphs of your piece here. Well, I'll let uh, Richard, Richard credit where it's due as the guy who actually crunched all the numbers on the standard deviations. So I'll go over to him for, the, for some, of the, some of the detail on that. The critical decision was to do standard deviations with regard to the preceding 10 years rather than to a longer period. Um, and obviously there's a big case for going over a longer period. Uh, the arguments against were that we'd had such a prolonged period of low rates and there was such a strong assumption that they were going to stay that way um, that it made sense to look at how extreme these rates look compared to the norm of the post global financial crisis decade so lots of financial structures in place now have been built on the assumption that rates stay very low and what we saw instead was an, a, a really massive shock gave us the UK guilt crisis, gave us the, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and others, um, even though rates weren't as high in absolute terms as they were in some other places. The, the point was, uh, if you looked at what the uh, assumptions were, what it, it appeared reasonable to assume rates were going to be, um, then what happened to, to rates in the UK uh, and here in the US <laughs> was you know, almost off the charts. It was something that whether they meant this or not, a lot of financiers had built their plans on the assumption that it just couldn't happen. Um, so that that is that I think is the the, the important point to make here. There, there are, you know, particularly some of the emerging markets like Mexico has been has had very bland you know, relatively controlled inflation for you know twenty five years now. It had really serious inflation for much of the 80s and 90s um i think it probably makes more if you'd gone back that far it would have made these rates look much less scary and i don't think that would have been as accurate a picture of uh, what the proportionate impact of these uh of these policies is and uh Yes, and I'm very, very grateful to Richard for calculating the, the Z-scores because uh, that was a lot of work. Richard, anything that surprised you as you were doing the data mining for this part of the piece? Uh, well, I, I think for me, what really stood out to me was the fact that you could see clear trends, right? The fact that um, um, the emerging markets, and I know we've made this point already, but we, when we talk about interest rate, we talk about, like, we keep hearing um, more about the developed market and the some of the key countries in emerging markets, you hear them as like more or less like anecdotes and all that. But I never, I never quite approached this thinking I would see a clear trend emerging where um, the emerging markets seem to be moving in some sort of unison where they hike quite almost like very responsive to inflation and then when things are beginning to look a lot more um dangerous if i should put put it that way for for developed market they seem to be a bit more comfortable in, in that they are um on a gradual descent back to uh, normalcy which it's a luxury that um, developed markets cannot really afford now Fair enough. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I could talk about the 
package all day here, uh, but uh, we we did take some uh, some reader questions ahead of this session, and I wanted to get into the speed round around that. Before we do, uh, John and Richard, are there any sort of big picture uh, points that you wanted to make about your uh, about your package to leave uh, leave readers with before we go into the speed round? Um, I, I think I probably made it the, the the point that surprised me. Uh, was that the emerging markets seem to have uh, been quite clever. And also, if you use the Z-score methodology, uh, you can find this if you scroll scroll down a bit further, the developed markets look really bad. Like you really do ask yourself, what on earth were they thinking? Um, not raising. So if we go down to the next chart from the one you're on there. Okay. So the dark blue line is where inflation was mm -hmm. as a z-score and the pale blue line is where interest rates were as a z-score so you had inflation more than four standard deviations above the norm in the developed world so this is something that happens i don't know a lot lot less than one you know one percent of the time a very rare event uh, and rates at that point were still actively below the norm that had been set for a low rate decade. Um, and if you compare that with how emerging markets responded, um, and even to a lesser extent to frontier, but the, um, it, it, there, there, was an, there were all kinds of arguments about transitory inflation at the time. Um, but this really does look like, how could they have uh, trying to avoid expletives, how could they have got it this badly wrong? It, it, it just looks like a, an immense error and that banks which were less confident in their currencies had more of a history of having to deal with inflation didn't make the same mistakes that the big developed market banks did. That, that, that was the one that really surprised me that this methodology showed, showed that so clearly. Yeah, it really, it really is striking. I mean, developed markets is basically a straight line up uh, after yeah. a long period of doing nothing. Whereas you could say that emerging markets were behind inflation to a certain degree, but you, but you see a smooth uh, trajectory that makes yeah. a certain amount of logical sense to an outsider like myself. So, and, it, and it's much less painful as it's going on. Yeah. Um, to for the people living. There. Sorry, yeah. Richard. Yeah, so I, I was just saying that um, it looks like um, the frontier market literally tracking the developed markets, watching them for clues in terms of what to do to to, to inflation. So when you when you take a look at it critically, it looks again, even when um, inflation was way above um, what is normal, they still kept um, rates within within normal level. So it's, I don't know whether it would be for the fact that they were also very particular about their currencies because they, they are more prone to um, volatility. So they probably were tracking the Fed or the ECB just to, to be sure that they do not move ahead of them because anything else they do probably would have um, a very uh, devastating consequence on their currencies. So I I think that that's, that kind of um, correlation between the frontier market and the development mm. Developed markets. Mm. For sure. Uh, um, yeah, no, I, I, I just love this graphic. I think it explains so much. Uh, and I could talk about this for a while. But I, I did want to move on to reader questions. Uh, we're very grateful to the folks who, who sent these in. Uh, and so I'm going to put John and Richard on the spot for a little bit of a, a speed round with the last seven or eight minutes we have here. Uh, so the first question, which I, I think really encapsulates uh, the uncertainty here for a lot of people, is quite simply, why is everyone so convinced that interest rates are coming down? I mean, if you, if, you know, if, if you talk to uh, a residential real estate broker or something, they'll, they, they'll say like, oh, yeah, you know, rate, rates are probably going to get get better a year from now. Uh, there are suggestions in the Fed's own summary of economic projections that we should expect rates to come down. But why does everybody seem to agree on this 
consensus, given the fact that there have been plenty of times in a not so distant past when interest rates were at these levels and people just considered it normal. Um, you, okay. Fair point. Uh, I think the last time we did a live stream together, I said I could remember being inflation at 26% at home in, in the UK. I mean, the, yes, these, these things can, can happen. Um, however, we have got very, very used to much lower rates for a very long time. Uh, and that is what the, uh, the, you know, the body economic is accustomed to. Um, I think the reasons why there is an assumption that rates will come down are that there is also an assumption that uh, the economy will go into decline. That assumption is increasingly being questioned here in the States, less so elsewhere. Uh, if the economy does slow down, if unemployment does go up, then yeah, the case for a rate cut is, is pretty strong. There's also been the belief, which got very strong after SBB last year, the, the bank, bank crisis now almost exactly a year ago, that, um, that lower rates would be necessary to avert a crisis. That, that if, you didn't, if you left rates like this, you would carry on until something breaks. Actually, it's quite interesting. That's a phrase that was very widely used a year or so ago, and I haven't heard for a while. But there was the assumption that high that rates would stay high until something breaks. Uh, I, I would agree um, myself that the confidence that rates are coming down is overdone, uh, and that it's very possible that we're moving back to not necessarily a world like the 1970s, but like the 80s and most of the 90s, where both rates and inflation are tending to be more like where they are now than where they've been for most of the time since the crisis. I, 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 do, I do agree with that. I think there is, the biggest risk, the biggest tail risk at the moment comes from um, the US just not, high, not cutting at all. That, that, that could happen um, and that would, that would send a lot of calculations awry. Okay. Uh, what do you make of trends in, in money supply? You know, th this is one of these things because Milton Friedman famously said mm. uh, decades ago that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And there are still monetarists out there, including uh, roaming the uh, the halls of uh, Twitter or, or, or X mm. uh, and uh, closely following M2 money supply. Uh, so money supply did explode during the uh during the pan pandemic years and it has been uh contractionary if you look at yeah. it on the bloomberg terminal for a little while so what do you what do you make of that it did did money supply really play a role in getting us into this mess and might it actually get us out personally i find it hard to believe that it didn't at the very least play a role i'm not sure whether milton friedman was right that it's always and everywhere about money supply but obviously the amount of money that's out there is a very big determining factor. And what happened in March 2020 was extraordinary. Like nothing had ever, nothing like that had ever happened before. The, the, the kind of massive expansion in the money supply that, that was administered at that point. What is interesting uh, in the last couple of years is, you're quite right, money supply has actually been going down year on year quite a lot of the time for the last two or three years. And normally in economics, you think that it's the move at the margin, the direction of travel that matters more than uh, the actual amount of money supply, that flow would matter more than stock. At mm. this point, um, if that version of monetarism was right, if I, I, was, if I was convinced that, that, this, that, that, that there's a slowing or reduction in money supply at the margin was going to make a difference um i would expect inflation to be you know we well, we might even be back into deflation by this point on the, on the, on that logic um mm. what we are instead finding is you know that there is still all kinds of different arguments about exactly how much of the you know, that p extra pandemic money supply is still in consumers' pockets here in the States, but there is a lot of it. And 
one of the consequences of central banks leaving rates as low as they did for as long as they did is that people were able to lock in very cheap rates, which means they haven't had to um, reset yet. That the, these uh, these rates haven't, and the reduction in the money supply hasn't really affected a lot of people who are still, you know, feasting off very cheap money. So I'm I'm not sure. I think the monetary I'm, I I don't think we can say the monetarists have been proved wrong, but we're learning some interesting subtle things about exactly how. Uh, money supply affects inflation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, another couple of questions here, uh, uh, John and Richard, uh, pertain to asset prices. And, and, you know, we know that central banks around the world, their, their mandates are typically focused on mm -hmm. prices uh, and to another extent, employment. I, I, I don't know that we, that we have any central bank anywhere in the world that has a, a mandate specifically to target asset prices. But there is some concern uh, that sometimes, uh, in fact, often you might say, uh, central banks' asset, uh, central banks' policies may have a role in pumping up asset prices. So we have a question here that says, uh, are stock markets overheated right now? And related to that, uh, any sense of what the end of yield curve control in Japan means for developed market equities? Shall I take this? Yeah, just okay, okay. have it. Um, okay. Uh, we need another live stream of half an hour to discuss whether <laughs> whether markets are overheated. Uh, the U.S. market is expensive by any measure, but. Um, there are some quite remarkable things going on with the big tech stocks called the Magnificent Seven. This isn't, I would say, a bubble. I would say it's over overpriced. I, I don't think it's good value at present. QE, uh, buying bonds to keep the yields down, effectively injecting money into the system. In the post-crisis decade, definitely contributed to this very strange situation where the markets behaved as though the economy was going great guns um, and a lot of people felt the economy was terrible. Um, if, if we want to get into the politics of the moment, it, it, I, I think QE did help asset prices and it also stoked inequality. There are good reasons why a lot of people didn't, don't like the way it worked out. Um, in terms of where we go from here, there are arguments quite a few people make the argument that the fed is wanting to cut so that it can support the stock market because a crash just before the election would be bad for biden uh i somehow doubt that that's what they're thinking um and it would be a very dangerous game if they did I certainly know a number of equity strategists, getting back to the earlier question you're asking about, are rates really so likely to come down, who are saying, well, we seem to have a strong economy and we're now going to get rate cuts. So bubble time. Um, I would think myself that asset prices, you know, asset price booms and busts can damage the economy. I would say myself that the current level of the US stock market was a reason for the Fed not to be cutting very much, if at all. Um, uh, I, I, I don't believe they would. I, I don't believe they would be in the business of stoking a bubble, and I doubt it would particularly help President Biden in the election if they did. Um, but you know, plainly, what central banks do uh, can have a big effect on uh, on stock markets. And sorry, the other thing to mention. The, significant exception of India, nowhere else looks particularly overblown at this point. It's, mm. it, it's very much a US story, and it really does center very much on what your take is on the business model of the magnificent seven big tech stocks, the big tech companies. Okay. So, so to, to close, uh, the, the last uh, reader question that I, I wanted to un underscore was, was concerning demographic trends and trends in global savings. Uh, but I, I'd like to frame it like this to, 
to end sort of sort of big picture. Uh, so there are a couple of questions before us concerning interest rates. One of them is when do they start fa falling in the big important markets? Uh, how fast do they come down? But perhaps just as importantly, where do they land? And I think that's where uh, these big questions like demographics and uh, productivity and so forth all come into play. Do you have a view on that uh, on that crucial final question there? I mean, I have a, I have views, but I wouldn't want to call them anything more than guesstimates. The critical thing for anybody who wants to not lose people's money in this environment is to know what you don't know and to have a certain degree of humility. My best guess is that we will have a decade or so when inflation is a bit higher than we've been used to and interest rates need to be a bit higher than we've been used to. And in the process, that will probably alleviate the problems with inequality to some extent, which I would be happy with because, you know, the level of dissension in society at the moment is pretty scary. Uh, and I think the, uh, I, I myself, if I had to bet, think I would think that we'll move to a situation which was more like the 90s or the latter. 80s uh, and that would be a consummation devoutly to be wished and if inflate if, if interest rates need to be more like four percent much of the time so be it all right well let's let's wrap it up right there uh thank you very much to richard abbey thank you to john authors and thank you to the folks who sent in questions for the two of them uh please by all means uh check out their package at uh, Bloomberg.com. Uh, it's called The Great Rates Descent Will Be Nasty, Brutish, and Long. Uh, and they will be updating this monthly to show everybody uh, how, how things are coming along around the world. Uh, so please do bookmark it and follow it. And we'll see you next time.